What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. You know, here's a crazy thing. Where I say that I've been reading Marvel comics for, you know, 20 something years, a huge bulk of that has been the X-Men. I mean, I always loved the X-Men. They were just my favorite team. Like they were one of my favorite groups really that existed in Marvel comics. I read other stuff just out of curiosity about what it was about, but like the meat and potatoes of most of my knowledge when it comes to Marvel comics is the X-Men. And this story is amazing. It's sad, but it's really, really amazing. So the Juggernaut, of course, is one of the more popular foes of the X-Men. I mean, in a lot of ways, I would argue he's more of the arch nemesis of Charles Xavier and by extension the X-Men, but Magneto is still probably the most popular villain. When people think of like the main enemy of the X-Men, they think of Magneto, and rightfully so. I mean, he was the first major villain they faced, but with regards to Juggernaut, he's always been this sort of wrecking ball. He's not very smart, but his history with his stepbrother, uh, Charles Xavier, created a lot of animosity between the two. And so because of the fact that they bickered and they argued and Kane Marco hated Charles, once he became the Juggernaut, you know, during the Korean War, when he picked up the Crimson Gem of Sidorak and, you know, he got that whole trans Scripture, you know, whosoever touches this gem shall receive the power of the crimson bands of Sidorak or whatever it is. Henceforth, you who read these words shall go forevermore a human juggernaut. Something along those lines, I'm paraphrasing. But the fact remains, once he became the juggernaut, he was like this unstoppable force. And it was kind of cool because in Marvel Comics, the juggernaut literally lives up to his words in almost every conceivable way. There was, for example, a time where the Incredible Hulk defeated the juggernaut, didn't really defeat him, but managed to push him back, which was supposed to be impossible. But it took the Incredible Hulk modified with celestial technology at the hands of Apocalypse in order to make that happen. Again, that all goes into the nature of the fact that Sidorak is one of these old demonic entities that exists in Marvel Comics. It's a wildly powerful being, but in terms of the Juggernaut, he's an avatar, as if Sidorak were walking around the world. Now, Juggernaut's not nearly as powerful as Sidorak, but it's still kind of cool, because what this story does is it basically comes after the events of X-Men number 11 back in 1965, written by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Now, the idea behind X-Men number 11 is that it basically introduced, at least I'm pretty sure it introduced, the character of the Stranger. And the Stranger is just one of those cosmic entities that exists out there. And he's literally called the Stranger because nothing's known about him. He's just a being who's there. He's got cosmic powers and that's really about it. But in that story, the Stranger had shown up on Earth and basically kidnapped Magneto and the Toad and whisked them off to his own planet just to explore and, you know, just study them. And so it was kind of cool in terms of how that little bit, a uh, little bit worked. But what this story does is it takes place in the interim when Magneto is off planet alongside Toad. And it initially opens up with this bit of an explanation. All the Avengers are dead. Thor's dead, Iron Man's dead, Captain America's dead, and standing over them all is the Juggernaut. Now, the initial indication here is that the Juggernaut's the one that did them all in, but then we end up finding out that it was actually the Sentinels that basically killed off all these different superheroes. And it's kind of cool when we get to see like Juggernaut versus the Sentinels, because one thing to keep in mind is that different writers interpret the powers of characters differently, and it's all contextual and based on what story they want to tell. For example, in this story, Juggernaut rips through these Sentinels. I mean, it's no challenge at all. I mean, he's got super strength, he's virtually unstoppable. Once he stops moving, or once he starts moving, he's nigh indestructible. One of them makes a comment. They have like less than 1% of a chance to actually survive the experience, like one ten thousandth or one one hundred thousandth of a percent in, in surviving the experience. And so it was kind of cool because where they try to take off, Juggernaut grabs him, basically kind of drags him back down and, uh, and you know, completely and totally pummels him. But if we go and read a story like Days of Future Past, that was a story Chris Claremont wrote, an Uncanny X-Men 141 and 142, I think it was. And it was basically the worst case scenario. It was an answer to the question what would happen if mutants failed? If Xavier was killed and Senator Robert Kelly was killed? What would happen if they were assassinated by mutants? And what would happen if humanity responded by jumpstarting the Sentinel program and the Sentinels went awry? It was a doomsday scenario. It was the worst case situation for Earth and more for the mutants than anything else because they'd failed in their entirety. And so the Days of Future Past led to the Sentinels more or less modifying their own programming, becoming autonomous, and then just wiping out the entirety of humanity, mutants and otherwise. And that was really about it. I mean, you had a few little, you know, rebel factions here and there. And of course that led into, you know, Rachel Summers, the daughter of Jean Grey and Cyclops from Days of Future Past, sending the mind of Kitty Pride into the past to stop the whole thing from happening. But still, the idea was that, you know, Sentinels had basically conquered Earth. And so when you go and you read that story, Juggernaut's long since been dead. He was eradicated by the Sentinels. And consolidating those two things is kind of difficult because if his power was has basically always been the same, if for the most part, up until Eighth Day, up until Tryon, his powers were basically consistent across the board, then how do you justify those two things? And there's really no way that you can. You just kind of 
have to roll with the punches and just say, hey, look, it's just the way it goes. <laughs> different writers want to tell different stories. But the cool thing about this is that Juggernaut gives us a lot of inner monologue in terms of how he views things in the sense that the Juggernaut was always very selfishly motivated in a lot of ways. I mean, he had a few friends here and there, like Black Tom Cassidy, for example, you know, who for the most part resided in Cassidy Keep. But for the most part, Juggernaut was largely just kind of a lone wolf out there by himself, doing whatever it is that he wanted to do because he could. He was more or less a bully who received these almost godlike powers in terms of strength, durability, speed, movement, different things like that. And so as a result, you know, with him basically losing everybody, believing that everybody out there is completely and totally dead, he actually goes back to the Xavier Institute. And this is very human of Kane Marco. I mean, he is human in and of himself. He just has incredible powers by way of the gym, but he almost seems inhuman in terms of how he acts. No one can stop the juggernaut. He's this unstoppable force. He doesn't seem to be human. But then when he shows up here, he basically has this sort of connection with Charles Xavier, where his argument is, yes, I hated them. Yes, I hated the X-Men. Yes, I hated Charles Xavier, but I would do anything to be able to talk to them again because I am just so absolutely lonely. He misses his connection with humanity because it's the one thing that he never really seemed to have before, you know? And so because of this, what he ends up doing is he basically ends up walking the earth for like days and weeks and years. Time just passes. It just sort of blurs together. And all he can do is just travel around the world and look at all these different shambles, bits and pieces, these relics of humanity. And so, you know, finally he comes across this old Sentinel base that he long since destroyed and the Sentinels begin coming to life only for us to realize they're being controlled by Magneto. And so this is cool because this is how this feeds in to X-Men issue number 11. In X-Men issue number 11 in that story written in 1965, Magneto managed to finally get out, you know, managed to, to basically make his way back to Earth. In this story, events unfolded almost the exact same way in the sense that Magneto is being studied by the Stranger, but he also gained access to a lot of the different devices that the Stranger had. As a cosmic entity, he's come across all different manner of devices from different alien races, things he's made on his own, and what these things allowed Magneto to do was basically look at the Earth and see what was going on. And what we end up finding out here is that when the Sentinels began their campaign and they started going around and killing all these different superheroes, that from Magneto's perspective, Juggernaut just kind of watched it all unfold. He just basically stood back and watched it all happen. While Juggernaut didn't necessarily kill the Avengers or the X-Men himself, his inaction allowed it to happen. But then we get like this massive revelation. What we end up finding out is that somewhere along the line, when Juggernaut presumably first, you know, became a major villain for the X-Men, uh, he showed up at the Xavier Institute and he basically killed all the X-Men. Not only that, you know, when he killed the X-Men, when he killed Charles Xavier, the whole nine yards, when the Sentinel program was reinitiated, when it all jump started again, there was nobody there to warn the Avengers, to warn the Fantastic Four. The Sentinels just kind of popped up out of nowhere, and where the X-Men have consistently fought the Sentinels, and where the X-Men are best suited to defeat the Sentinels because of their knowledge about the Sentinels' design, the X-Men weren't there because Juggernaut killed them. And so because of that, there was no one left to defend humanity. There was nobody left there to, to save humans. And so as the Sentinels began going through and wiping out humans, what Sentinels began to realize is that humans do procreate at a ridiculous rate. And so because of that, it would basically take too long, and the Earth would be almost eradicated in its entirety, virtually uninhabitable, if the campaign went on. And so what they ended up doing was in an effort to basically eliminate as many humans as possible, they basically modified their own cells to emit a kind of radiation. And so the earth itself is just blanketed in all this radiation. And that's what killed all the humans. That's what killed everybody. It was basically the juggernaut who killed the X-Men, which led to the deaths of almost everything in existence. But the reason why I say almost is because in the juggernaut's rage at this revelation, the fact that he's the one that basically led to everything coming to an end, he starts freaking out, stomping on the ground, only to fall down into this cavern and discover discover the Iceman Bobby Drake. Now, this is kind of cool in terms of how this feeds on Iceman's history. Historically speaking, Bobby Drake has always been a little bit reckless and a little bit just sort of headstrong and more of the jokester than anything else. He's very much indicative of like your stereotypical teenager, you know, and because of that, he never really applied himself the way that he needed to. Now, that also went into the idea of why it is that Bobby Drake was so popular, but with him failing to basically focus and harness his abilities the way that he should, because this is relatively early in the days of the X-Men, this meant that once Charles Xavier died, there was no one there to teach Bobby Drake how to use his powers. And so for the most part, he can't control his abilities. And in this instance, you know, where he says, I can only maintain this current form for a few moments at a time, the amount of time that he, he maintains it goes on too long. And he basically encases himself in ice and he can't get out. He can't shut his powers down. But because of the fact that Bobby Drake had basically made reference to the fact that there are people here, Juggernaut and his desire to see more of humanity and his desire to experience a connection smashes through Bobby Drake and then smashes through the door. And of course, when he shows up, we 
we end up finding out that characters like Quicksilver are alive. Scarlet Witch is alive. Toad, who's basically sort of this jokey henchman of, uh, of Magneto, are alive. And there's a few other mutants here and there, but there's also a lot of people. And that's kind of the irony of all this, because what Toad tells us is that when Magneto came back to Earth and realized the Sentinels were basically running amok, they were wiping out humanity in the process, wiping out whatever mutants were left, basically killing everything they could find, Magneto and Toad grabbed as many people as they could, human or mutant, threw them into their ship, and then whisked them off to this location to basically create a safe haven of sorts. And so with this, with this radiation spreading throughout the world, they effectively created a, a bunker that protected them from it. But the irony is that with Juggernaut showing up and Juggernaut smashing down the door in his effort to experience and to talk to more people, he doomed them all to death. He's basically doomed the last remnants of humanity and mutants to die at the hands of this toxic radiation because he wanted to see them so badly. And that goes into the nature of the Juggernaut, right? I mean, he, he leaps before he looks and you know, he doesn't think about what's actually happened. He just does things and then whatever happens, happens. And so despite the fact that he was longing for a connection, that he actually broke into this place intending no ill will, he dooms what's left of humanity. He basically killed everybody on earth. And so it was kind of cool because in this scenario, he's basically forced to just sort of walk off, live, just kind of exist because he doesn't need food. He doesn't need water. He's effectively immortal. So long as he's in possession of the Crimson Gem, the Juggernaut is the last man on earth. That's it. There's no one left. The last vestiges, the last little tidbits of whoever was alive were in that bunker and they're all dying now. I mean, they're, they're, they've got minutes. And so because of that, he's just doomed to walk the earth forever until the earth's destruction or it's repopulated or whatever the case may be. And so again, it's pretty dark and it's pretty messed up. To me, it's one of the coolest juggernaut stories that's out there. So with that being said, guys, we're gonna go ahead and bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.